Welcome to the Philocrosophy Podcast, where host and lacrosse expert Jamie Monroe will do what he does best, talk about lacrosse. Each episode will provide listeners with education, insights, stories, and lessons about the lacrosse world. We will discuss current events, coaching, philosophies, and college lacrosse recruiting. Now let's get started with your host, Jamie Monroe. I'm really excited to welcome Sean Kerwin, offensive coordinator and assistant coach from the University of Virginia to the Philosophy Podcast. Sean, congrats on an awesome year, and thanks a lot for joining us on the show. No problem. Thank you for having me. Excited to be here. <laughs> and um, as we usually kick off these uh, podcasts, I, I would love to hear about your journey first as a player and some of your key mentors, and then we'll talk a little bit about your coaching journey. Awesome. Yeah, no, I, you know, I, I grew up around this sport. Um, you know, I started at a really young age, organized, you know, kindergarten, first grade. My dad played in college, played at Hobart. Um, you know, so I've been around the sport my whole life. Uh, you know, was really fortunate to uh, live in a town. I lived in Booton Township, but we all go to uh, Mountain Lakes High School. It's right next to Mountain Lakes, New Jersey. Um, you know, and I was, you know, very fortunate to Grow up in that that program. Um, I like to compare it. I mean, the, they just go nuts for lacrosse uh, in Mountain Lakes. I like to compare it to Texas high school football. Yeah, uh, really, just the, the whole town rallies around it. It's uh, you know, it's a small school. We're a Group One school in New Jersey, which is the smallest public schools. And uh, you know, so I grew up in a playing in a great uh, youth and middle school program, and then uh, was very fortunate to play under uh, the legendary coach Tim Flynn, who's you know, New Jersey's all-time winning high school coach. He was, uh, was the U19 head coach at one point, won a gold medal with the U19 Team USA team. Um, you know, one of the best high school coaches to ever do it. So, you know, I was really fortunate to grow up in that program and be around that program, my, you know, growing up through uh, middle school and then into high school. Uh, and then, you know, was uh, really lucky to get an opportunity to play uh, collegiately at, at Tufts University. Um, under Coach Mike Daly, he's not head coach Brown. Um, he recruited me out of high school, and you know, and <laughs> I mean, we were lucky enough my sophomore year to be on the national stage and winning the uh, the school's first uh, national championship in any sport. So it was kind of a whirlwind how I got there. Um, that was back when you did, you know, you didn't make decisions until the summer going into your senior year with recruiting, and uh, you know, you went on official visits. You visited a bunch of schools before you made your decision. You get to meet guys on the team. It's changed. It's got, getting back there with the uh, yeah. the new recruiting roles. But man, uh, it got to a point where it was getting a little ridiculous there. Um, but you know, you know, like I said, I decided on on Tufts, and uh, my sophomore year, I found myself on the field uh, as a starting attackman uh, for that program. And then you know, three years later, you know, won a national championship as, as a sophomore. We made it back to the finals. My my junior year was a two time All American. Um, and then uh, was, again, very fortunate with a lot of breaks that I've had, uh, was asked to stay on staff after graduation uh, and coach at my alma mater at Tufts as a graduate assistant for, for two years. Wow. Yeah, and, you know, and, and before I got to uh, – and honestly, before I got to Tufts, um, you know, I really thought that I wanted to coach high school across. You know, I always knew I wanted to coach. And, you know, when you grow up in a town where all you know is – high school, Mountain Lakes, New Jersey, lacrosse, like that is, seems like the, the best job ever is, you know, to be a high school lacrosse coach and teach. And that's all I really, all I knew until I got to Tufts and, and realized like, Hey, wow, this is, there's a whole nother level to this. And, you know, I can coach collegiately. Um, and then, like I said, would pair that up with the opportunity that coach Daly gave me to, to coach. Um, you know, so it was great. I always considered myself somewhat of a coach on the field, you know, I, my dad coached me growing up. So I kind of had that, son of a coach mentality and uh, you know, applied it to how I played. And like I said, then it kind of kick-started my, my college coaching career at Tufts. The Philocrosophy podcast is brought to you in part by the JM3 Coaches Training Program. If you are a coach interested in sharpening your saw, like so many of the guests on the show, you are going to love the content in this program. Go to www.jm3coaches.com for more information. What um, what was the philosophy at, at Tufts? Um, I mean, I think I kind of know, but share with us like the, the offensive philosophy that you kind of grew up with as a player and that you grew up with as a coach and, and, and how it's kind of, you know, transitioned or, or evolved. 
Yeah, you know, it, it's, uh, you know, some things have definitely changed, and but the, the core principles have, have always remained the same. And, and that is, you know, putting pressure on, on our opponents, no matter the situation. Um, at any point in time, you know, as soon as they step off the bus, we wanted to go uh, and put as much pressure as we possibly could. And now you can do that in multiple ways and how you put pressure on your opponent. Uh, and then it's also playing to your own strengths at the same time. So they kind of go hand in hand. And no matter where I've been, that started really at Tufts, knowing that, uh, you know, you just didn't have enough time in the NESCAC with no fall ball and not starting until February 15th that you really had to be concise. You had to, uh, you know, that's something Coach Daly taught me is just being, you know, being really efficient with your time and, uh, you know, making sure that, um, you know, that you weren't wasting time, I think was the biggest thing. And, uh, you know, so learning those two things and how important they were, obviously the up-tempo style that we played, that's where that pressure comes in. All the, uh, the sub game, um, strategies that we use even now here at Virginia, that's all about, you know, making defenses uncomfortable, making opponents uncomfortable. Um, and then you couple that with playing to your personal strengths. And, and the best way I can describe that is if you look at, at when I played at Tufts to when I coached at Tufts to when I coached at Brown to now at Virginia, the concepts have stayed the same, but we've run different offenses everywhere I've been every year that I've been at each place things look a little different and that's because each team's a little different and everyone's strengths are a little different. And, you know, and that's one of my favorite parts of, of the job is that puzzle piece aspect of it where, you know, you get to kind of toy around and change what you're doing to make sure that no, no matter what the six guys that you're putting out there, they're, they're all playing to, to their, their best. And in order to do that, you want to make sure you're, you're setting them up for success, putting them in positions that they're comfortable in and, um, and hopefully those positions that they're comfortable in are also positions that the makes the opponents uncomfortable, which kind of captures the, uh, the first part. From a leadership perspective, Coach Daly is always praised as being such a great leader of men and creating such a great culture. What did you take? What, what are some of the things you took from him um, in your own, you know, uh, coaching style? Yeah, it's uh, his, uh, the way he manages people is just it's something I'll always take with me. He's uh, such a people's person. He understands how each individual ticks, especially the guys that he coaches directly, you know, his teams. Um, he knows what buttons to push per guy, how the pulse of the team, what each team needs in a given moment. Um, never met someone that has such a great grasp uh, like he does um, to a point where, you know, it's it was a, it was really a pleasure to – coach with him because you know as he's managing this team he's allowing me to flourish as an offensive coach and and put in schemes and strategies you know on the, on the x's and o's offensive side of things that align with the beliefs that we've always had and allowed me to put my own little twist on it while I'm learning how to press these same buttons and bring the best out of of each individual on the team um, and, you know, and he does that with how he handles, you know, how he's handled me on staff and every other coach that, that has worked under him as well. Uh, so just that aspect in general, I, I, like I said, I've never met someone that has such a great pulse like, like he does and, uh, and such a great people person. So then you transitioned to Brown and you got to coach for, and still do, for Lars Tiffany, my uh, college teammate, Lars and I were captains of the 1989 Brown team way back in the day. But, um, uh, Lars is a great friend and a great coach. Um, and so I'd love to hear two things. One is, uh, what was it like to transition from, you know, GA at Division Three to being an offensive coordinator in Division One, and, and, and from a lot of different levels? But And then also I'd like to hear your uh, opinions on sort of what you learned from Lars, you know, in the early years and what you continue to learn. Yeah, and, uh, you know, it was, it was definitely different. Um, you know, it was – I learned a ton – my first year working for, for Lars, you know, here I am, you know, 24 years old, just won a national championship at Tufts and had a great, I mean, we broke scoring records and, and everything. And, you know, of course, I, I won't lie to you. I came in, you know, super confident and, and everything I'm doing. And, you know, very quickly I learned that there was, there was a whole nother layer to, to this sport and, and to each individual side of the ball and to player development. You got to understand too, the only thing I've known collegiately up until that point was NESCAC lacrosse, where in the fall, you know, we're not around the guys on the team. You know, it'll start till February 15th. Now, the Ivy League has restrictions 
but nowhere in comparison to the NESCAC. And so yeah. as even though everyone else thinks that the Ivy League's held back, for me, it was like, wow, what am I going to do with all this time? You know, there's a fall ball. Like, I never experienced that before. So, you know, learning the importance of being concise and prepared for player development and, uh, you know, the – like, playing the long game, I guess you can say, is, is something that I learned that, that first year, just knowing how much time you have, but also understanding that it's not that much. And you gotta be, con you gotta be concise with what you're doing. You gotta be consistent with, with what's important to you. Uh, so I learned that very quickly. Uh, and then, you know, and he, Coach Tiffany, um, really helped me become a more prepared offensive coach. Um, as you know, that man loves getting a whiteboard marker in his hands and talking X's and O's. And I love it too. Um, don't get me wrong. It's something that he and I, when I first met him, something that we've, we've shared that interest from the get go. Uh, but, you know, he's always, he always was challenging me and always was, you know, asking the right questions and, and nitpicking, um, you know, and, you know, being 24 years old, you know, I think I thought I knew more than I did. Um, and so, you know, I was a little resistant at first and then realizing, you know, very quickly, you know, that this was only going to help me. It's been, it's been great. And, uh, you know, so he really taught me how to prepare, uh, how to scout, uh, you know, how to, uh, what are some examples? Uh, yeah, I mean, just his meticulous note taking after games was something that, uh, immediately caught me off guard my first year of, you know, how much time he spends after games, you know, kind of that post game write up and report and, and, you know, how much, how important it is for the next year. I didn't think I realized that until having been there two years uh, to realize how important that was and how helpful it can be. And, um, you know, and I think that was, that was, that was big. Uh, you know, again, it helped me understand the proper ways to prepare. And, and now that we're at Virginia, you know, I really do feel like, uh, you know, I can't speak for any other program, but, you know, there were very few games where we went in feeling, not feeling, if anything, over-prepared. Uh, it's just something that I've it, that's grown a skill set that's grown of mine uh, since working for Lars, um, and uh, you know I I, I wouldn't know because I haven't worked for anyone other than him and, and Coach Daly. But you know I wonder if working for anybody else, it, I wouldn't be where I am today as far as how I am uh, with my preparation and being concise with the message that I'm I'm bringing across to to the guys. And you know he's uh, I can't say enough positive things about my relationship with Lars. Um, he lets me he gives me full autonomy of the offense he allows me to be creative and uh, he trusts me with everything that we're doing but at the same time he continuously demands uh the best from me he, he wants uh to bring out the best in me and he still does that to this day and you know i can sit here on this on this podcast and say that i've improved as a coach every year that i've been in this profession and i owe that tremendously to to him um you know, because he continues to challenge me, and I, and I and I love that challenge. I continue to ask for more, so it's yeah. uh, it's been a really great three years uh, of working for him, or I guess now five years, it's three at Virginia yeah. and, and two at two at Brown. Speaking of Brown, so you guys uh, went to the NCAA tournament in 2015, um, had a good team, lost at Denver. I was actually uh, on that game. I did the uh, oh, yeah, I remember that you and Booker. Yeah, me and Booker. Yeah. Um, and, um, and, and, but you guys made a massive transition from, you know, good team, playoff team in 2015 to great team uh, in 2016 that arguably has had Dylan Malloy not been injured. I, I, I believe you guys would have won the championship. And frankly, that had about as much talent on that 2016 Brown team as there's been in a number of years. Like, I think that team could have beaten anybody. So you had this talent. But you guys also, you guys also, I think, became more disciplined, um, you know, um, you know, on both sides of the ball. But speaking of the offensive side, what, what did you kind of, what did you learn from 15 to 60 in your, you know, in your only your second year in Division One lacrosse? What were some of the adjustments that you made, and then some of the specifics of how you leveraged that talent? Yeah, I think that one of the biggest things that I learned was how to balance giving your your offensive players freedom but then also having a certain structure and a certain level of standards that you needed to hold them to as well. Um, I think I was blinded by the program that I was raised in at, at Tufts was such a, looking back on it, was such a well-oiled machine as far as the culture and the message of, hey, this is what we do. This is how we're going to play. You know, it was self-taught 
in the fall in, in the, all those captain's practices that, you know, I don't think I realized it to, you know, going to a place like Brown where, you know, to me, my first year, I was like, all right, let's just give them the same types of freedoms that we had when I was a player and when I was coaching at Tufts and let's just roll the ball out and play and give them a couple things, but then let them, let them be athletes and, and, and show their talent. And, you know, I don't think I realized how much structure there really was um, that without really noticing it at, at Tufts and that there was a certain level of, of, of structure there um, that you just took for granted, I, I guess I should say. Uh, so, you know, when you look at our 2015 team, we, we weren't the most complex offense. We were actually pretty stagnant. Uh, we were doing some things that didn't put a lot of pressure on, on defenses. They were pretty easy to defend with our personnel. Um, you know, and that's something that I didn't realize until re-watching games after that year. Um, like I said, you're kind of in the thick of it during the season. You make a couple of adjustments here or there, but then, you know, kind of re-watching every game and kind of self-critiquing, self-evaluating. I just started to realize that we weren't really doing what we wanted to do from the get-go, which is constantly putting pre putting our opponents under pressure and under duress. And we were doing it in some phases, don't get me wrong. Our transition game was fantastic that even that year and you know, even our, our sub-game stuff. But then when we got into that 6v6 phase and that settled offense phase, we left a little bit to be decided. We're pretty one-dimensional there. Uh, bringing in 2016, that was the biggest you know, adjustment that I wanted to make and you know something that Coach T um, – you know, challenged me to do as well was just to be a little bit more uh, diverse with what offenses we were running, put, uh, you know, change up formations, change up schemes a little bit. Uh, really just honestly just try to find ways to make defenses more nervous, put, put a little bit more pressure on them, make them think and how to game plan, uh, make their jobs a little bit harder. Um, so that, that was honestly, I think the biggest difference between 2015 and 2016 is we learned how to play, myself included, we learned how to play settled 6v6 offense uh, at the division one level. Um, and you, you guys know, have had awesome personnel, you know, with Dylan Malloy and you right. know, the lefty Blinn. And then Tyler Lestry was fantastic. He's one of the most I mean, all those guys yeah. in the midfield. Uh, Brandon Caputo, Matt, uh, Bailey Tills, we had running out of the box playing midfield. Yeah. You know, Matty Graham was great for us. You know, that, 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 top six, that top six was as talented as, as it gets. Uh, no question about it. So that, that helps, you know. But no, that was yeah. the, same, the same talent we had the year before. Yeah. Um, you know, again, they're, they're a year older for sure. And a lot of guys, you know, really hit their stride their senior year. Uh, but, you know, it was, that was the biggest change I thought from that 15 to 16 year. One of the, one of the fascinating things about, and I don't know Coach Daly all that much, but from what it sounds like uh, at Tufts, the, the culture, because of the NESCAC, not, you know, the, the team was running its own fall ball and they were really involved with creating their own culture. And I think sometimes at the division one level, you know, there's so much time with the kids. The coaches are making all the decisions, right? The decisions on everything you do. It's like a video game on the field. And I think that, you know, the one extreme is, you know, roll the ball out and sometimes you look great and sometimes you're taking terrible shots and throwing it away. The other extreme is it's everything is orchestrated. And while you might not make as many mistakes, you never get that, that creativity. And, um, and, and so, um, how, you know, how do you sort of couple those two concepts together to kind of get it the right blend? No. Yeah. And that, that's, that's the, that's the challenge every year, right? It's, it's finding yeah. that balance and every team needs a little bit more or a little bit less structure or a little bit more, or a little bit less creativity. Yeah. Um, you know, that's something that you gotta, you know, make sure as a coach and something I try to do every fall is really evaluate who you're coaching and who you have and yeah. not only what who you have on day one but where do you think they can get to you know if you have a group that yeah on day one needs a lot of structure but you're starting to realize that you're doing it like hey we can get them to a point where they're playing pretty free and loose and just giving them a couple guidelines I'll, I'll be honest with you you look at our our progression this past year uh you know that was that was us in some ways you know I think we had a little bit more structure in the beginning of the year than we did at the end and you know I, I know you've done some breakdowns on what we've done uh, in our playoff run you know there's it's pretty simple you know it's it's there's a lot of freedom in in the simplicity that's there there's a couple reads that we do but when it came down to it um, we really wanted to make sure we uh, put our guys in strengths and let them and let them you know make some simple reads and be creative with it and uh, yeah. You know, that we weren't doing that as well. We're still doing the same things in the beginning of the year, but it was, I definitely felt a little bit more structured. And then looking back on the games, definitely was more structured earlier yeah. in the year than it was towards the end. 
So one last uh, topic on 2016, because it's so interesting to me. Tell us a little bit about Dylan Malloy. I mean, that guy was just such a marvelous player. <laughs> He's a very unique player. I'm not sure. I mean, I can't think of a player ever that really is like him as far as skill set and body type and, and just overall toughness and production. Are you kidding me? Um, so talk a little bit about him as a player, some of the nuances of his game that interest you, but also, you know, how you tried to help him and help him develop. Yeah. You know, he's, um, first of all, you know, you, you'll, you won't find, uh, be hard pressed to find someone that, that loves playing the game more than Dylan. And I think that was the first thing that stood out when you, you watch him and, you know, the first practice he's hooting and hollering. He just truly loves having the stick in his hand and, and, and competing. Um, so that was, that was the first thing that popped out. It didn't matter what the drill was, as long as there was a, a, you know, a motive, if there was a goal, you could score, you know, he was as, as invested and all in as he possibly could be. And like I said, having a great time doing it. Um, you know, I think that him coupled with, I always love talking about Dylan in the same breath as talking about the guy that he uh, played with in Kyler Balestri, because as great as Dylan was, the chemistry that those two had was as unique as you'll find. It, it really, you know, I, I do see similarities in, in our own Matt Moore and Ian Laviano um, yeah. here in Virginia. I do. It's not at that level yet, uh, but it's, it's definitely getting there. I mean, it's just those two had, were had such a pulse on each other's games and played off each other so well that it made it really fun as a coach. And, and Kyler's very much the coach's son, a little bit more, you know, he, he, don't get me wrong, he had a blast playing as well, but he's a little bit more serious. He's, he's the one that's, you know, making sure Dylan's not messing around too much, you know, and uh, kind of babysitting him a little bit. Uh, but like I said, the two of them together really is what made that, that attack unit. I mean, you throw in a lefty shooter like every yeah. one that made yeah. that unit so lethal. And, you know, Dylan was, you know, he's such a bull in the China shop type of player. Yeah. So, you know, when, you know, when I got to Brown, my, you know, my biggest thing was trying to get him to slow down and uh, just, you know, not charge in there as much and get into that no man's land where it's literally, you know, him beating a triple team and scoring or the ball is going on the ground and going the other yeah. way. So, you know, trying to slow him down and understand how to control the guy on him, the man covering him while reading through the defense and make, cause yeah. he, you know, I mean, he's such a, you know, generational talent that you know, every time he touched the ball, you knew he was going to draw two guys. So it was, you know, working with him on how to see where those two guys, you know, where that extra guy was coming from, what reads to make based on, you know, what defenses were throwing at him and, and, and things like that. So that's where I came in to help him reach, you know, hopefully I could like to think I helped him reach that next level was, you know, uh, I can remember, you know, a day in September going out there with our volunteer assistant and strapping him up in a helmet and a football blocking pad. And I'd be an extra defenseman coming inside and, you know, just ha helping him, you know, break it down to a simple level of, all right, here's where the slide's coming from. These are your options. And, you know, and then being, you know, pretty concise with them and then applying that to film uh, as we would prepare for opponents, say, Dylan, this is where teams want to slide to where, we're more likely to slide to you for, you know, obviously we have to be ready for anything, but we're expecting this. So these are the reads we expect you to make. And um, so that's where he changed. You know, if you look at his numbers between 2015 and 2016, the goals were kind of similar, how many goals he scored, but his assist numbers were through the roof. Yeah. Uh, I, I think he, great vision. he, he was close to a 60 and 60 type year, uh, yeah. that year, you know, and so. Um, you know, that's where he changed and that's where we helped him develop was, you know, being more of that quarterback distributor feeder type because he knew of how because we knew how much uh, attention he was going to draw it's kind of funny you, you just uh, referenced before we got started here that you were um, teaching kids at camp you know how to see sliders and manipulate them and really the main thing for Dylan Malloy was you know be able to see sliders and manipulate them you know I mean right. is there any more important than that in the game is to be able to like you know not have to pay attention to your own man so you can see what other people are doing to be able to beat your man without really focusing on him yeah, and then, you know, that was, the, that was the basis of the offense that we ran towards the end of the year this past year was, you know, there are certain ways to slide to that type of offense. We, if, as long as we understand what those options are and understand, all right, this is the option that the defense is picking, then, then we understand what reads we should make. And that's where that, that um, 
power can go back into the players' hands because, you know, they're, they're the ones that are prepared enough to understand what their read should be. The Philocrosophy Podcast is made possible in part by the JM3 Video Assessment Tool. There is no question that video is critical to player development. One way or another, your son or daughter must utilize video to learn their game and the game. To learn more, see video testimonials, or register, go to www.jm3sports.com forward slash video right now. You guys, um, well, let's talk a little bit about it. Um, you know, first of all, congrats on the championship. It was so fun to watch that run. I mean, just magical run. Um, and the way you guys played offense, it was really simple. I mean, it was. It seems like primarily a big little behind out of the deuces with a kind of a backside cut out of usually out of Laviano, but, you know, a little sort of sit there, ball side high, and then two shooters out top, and you were able to kind of put your players in different spots. And people did play you different ways. And if they didn't really slide much, like Gail, you scored one-on-one. -on -one. And if they did show and slide, like Duke, you know, you fed it. Um, but um, talk about what, why you picked that and some of the nuances and, and, and the things that people might find interesting, you know, the, all the coaches that are listening. Yeah, you know, it's uh, – you know, part of that's just personnel identity, right? You know, understanding that we had two pretty unique alpha male type talents on the attack, you know, guys that, that no matter who was guarding them, we, we felt confident in their matchups. Um, now there are some fantastic, fantastic individual defensemen out there yeah. um, that are great shutdown defensemen for teams. Number ones. Uh, thankfully we were in a position where we knew we had two number one dodging attack. So we liked our odds against uh, teams number two defensemen with our one of our two. So, you know, we, a lot of what we ran and who was doing a lot of initiating depended on how teams wanted to match up with us. Uh, so, you know, we went into every game, you know, with Matt and Mike, knowing that one of them was probably going to dodge a little bit more than the other. They're both going to, to get their fair share of touches. But depending on who was guarding who, that's who we would put off ball and that's who we'd put – uh, on ball. So kind of started with that, having those two guys, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a big believer in putting your top six offensive players out there, no matter the position. So a lot of times our fourth attackman tends to be in that top six. So he's a great invert option. This year we had number 42, Mike Herring, who's senior son of a coach, high, really high IQ, uh, a player who actually wants to get into college coaching. Um, and I think he'll be great. Uh, he's got that, that mind for it. Um, yeah. You know, he's like an extension of myself on the field, it felt like. Uh, so he was kind of that, that blue flex guy. He would be behind the cage setting some big littles. He could play off ball on the inside with Ian. Uh, we can kind of move him around uh, depending on, on the matchups. Um, you know, and obviously he's you know, someone where if we ever got switches, he could easily plug and play uh, for any of those positions as well. Uh, and then you throw in our, our two middies, Docs and, and Ryan. And, and you know, the, the thing about Ryan that a lot of people don't realize, uh, Conrad, that is, is how talented he is off ball. Yeah. He, he actually, he's, he's a very, very talented off ball finisher. He moves well. He understands spacing. So, you know, you throw him and Herring, they were like our flex guys. Herring more of our flex between the crease and behind. And Conrad more of our flex between up top and, and the crease. So we can move those two two guys around, and then you have Doc Aiken up top, who can just dominate the middle of the field and stretch a defense and, and just you know attract so much attention up top. So you have your two guys behind, you know, and then you got your two flex guys and you know, your one bomber up top, and then you all you really need is that one steady presence on the inside, and that's where Ian comes in. So um, you know, knowing that those were you know more more than likely going to be our top six offensive players this year, that's where that started is understanding yeah. that, you know, this is where we're comfortable. This is where we want to go. And all right, how are we going to do this? And, you know, for whatever reason, this team just really gravitated to having success at, uh, with the invert. Um, you know, we could, with the same personnel, we, you could run any often. That's right. Cool. It's, uh, you know, at the end of the day, you, you got guys that can win matchups and, and you want to put them in great spots. And so it's understanding where they're comfortable. And this group in particular, they seem to understand the reads from behind the cage, maybe a little bit more than from the wings or up top. Not to say that we didn't do much. We did, you know, we certainly dodged our fair share up top from the wings. But, you know, when it came down to it, as that shot clock was running down, we wanted the ball behind because we understood, you know, what those reads were and how to attack a defense. And like I said, that just came from 
throwing a couple different looks at our guys through the fall and in the preseason. And all right, this is something that they, they really understand the best of, of those options. And, and, and so let's, let's ride with this, uh, especially when we need it in that crunch time, which obviously is playoff time. It's uh it's one of those things where though it's an offense that if you aren't moving properly and you're kind of lazy with it, it can look very stagnant and it could yeah. look, um, and that's why I think you saw some of these lulls and, and, you know, and maybe we're needing some of these comebacks, but I mean, you go and you watch any comeback we had this past year, any fourth quarter in particular, if that game was close and online, our guys knew the importance of each possession, you saw crisp movement, you saw great spacing, you saw, you know, hard dodges and you saw right reads and, and, you know, it's, that's where a lot of that success at the end of games came from was just guys moving as, as a unit and, and playing as a six man unit, understanding the, uh, the reads and the principles within the offense. It is really cool though, to be able to do something that is just so simple and just ride that, you know, yeah. um, I mean, because there's so many good things to do in so little time, right? <laughs> I mean, that's basically the deal. Um, and the way that you guys had your spacing inside on the crease to the way that you guys attacked from behind. And you, it's funny because you didn't rely so much on the classic big little get a switch. It was just more like, um, you know, just just a 2-2-2 two, two, two with good spacing out front. If they had to slide, it's three covering four, and you guys had great spacing. Yeah, um, and, you know, I think we used early in the shot clock, we used a lot of that time to see if we can get switches. You know, we weren't just dive bombing at the first yeah. opportunity. Yeah. yeah. But we also knew that, hey, if they got through everything and there were no switches, we were very comfortable yeah, with what we would do with how we wanted to do it. So it's, uh, yeah, no question. So I mean, it's, uh, some more like, what, I had a pull on me? Oh, okay. <laughs> right, right, exactly. Yeah. So that was pretty awesome. Um, while we're on it, I mean, there was a lot of fun offenses to watch, and I'm sure you're going to be, you know, studying everybody out there. Um, but, uh, you know, when you look at Yale's offense, for example, I loved what they did. I love the hang-up game they played uh, behind the game. I love the way that they, you know, used their Canadian inside to create issues on mirrors and sliding. Um, what, how would you sort of uh, describe their offense? What did you like about it? Um, what do you like about that sort of one forward fade look and all that? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's hard, it's hard not to admire the flow of their yeah. offense. It, it yeah. just is very much, it just like, you know, you talk about putting pressure on defense. You're always on them when you're playing defense against them. Right. And yeah. uh, I think what they did a great job of is, uh, under making teams pay for trying to you know steal some space and, and show a little bit too much you know if you were playing that showing game with them they were going to pick you apart and get you chasing um I, I thought they did a great what job by that? just you know it's I think it's really easy as someone's dodging towards you as a defenseman or even if they're dodging towards your a, a dangerous area if let's just say you're defending from the crease I see it more coming from adjacent but just that yep. when you get that frozen defenseman who's thinking about Hey, is, am I going? Am I, you know, who's not as concerned? Uh, like I said, you see it happen more as an adjacent. It was all of a sudden the guy's dodging at you, and you might not have taken a step towards him, but you also didn't take a step away. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden that pass forward can get you chasing, and now the next yeah. guy's thinking, Are, is he beat? Am I trying that that whole scrape game? And yeah, yeah. You know, that's something that if you watch, if you watch Yale defensively, they're, they're fantastic at that, that scrape and show adjacent. Uh, they, they do that really well, better than most. And that's because, you know, and that's why their offense is so good at attacking yeah. it. I think it's yeah. really every day. Um, yeah, that's where they do it act so well. And then they, they take, they really make you pay on the shows off the mirrors too. Like if you, sometimes you show a little and don't go and they just bounce and turn the corner and score. And other times you show a little bit too much and then, you know, you, you know, you th they throw back, they throw back to Godet or something, and, and he's just getting a time to room shot. Yeah, and they, they put a ton of pressure on you know, those low wings and then that underneath move. I mean, the kid's Sesso was as good as it gets when it comes to that, right? He just kind of post up on that lefty wing, and you play a little bit too top side that he's ducking under you and coming underneath, kind of in that dive, you know, dive across the crease look. And, you know, if you're trying to take that away, he's strong enough to beat your top side. And, you know, they do that really well. Uh, operating from those low wings you know I think with the dive and in, in play that you know that's something that a lot of teams did you saw a lot of teams really you know putting pressure on defenses in those little pinch points uh right where uh you know right around that crease area uh it's a hard it's a hard place to defend especially now that the offensive player can dive 
that Yale Penn State game was just an epic game, wasn't it? Oh yeah, man, it's uh, that thing you guys was were like never. We never wanted it to end. You know, knowing yeah. we were going to play one of them, we were asking keep for you know, that game to keep going. It, it looked like it kept going too. I mean, you guys, you know, meanwhile, had played an overtime game that had to be incredibly emotionally draining. Yes. Uh, you know, and then to watch them, you know, to sit there knowing you're going to the final and you're watching these two teams battle, and it was just such an epic game. And talking about offenses, I mean, how about that Penn State offense? I, I actually studied a study on it, did a webinar on it. I mean, I love that offense. I think it's so cool. Yeah, it's, it's, it's incredible. It's so different and so unique. And the, the way that they cut and move and the way that they're able to generate offense with not necessarily needing to win matchups and, you know, or you know, at least completely win them. And, right. and as soon as you challenge them to do it, they had the personnel to do it. And so uh, I give them a ton of credit with what they were doing all year. Um, you know, and just, I mean, you wouldn't find a more <laughs> – talk about a hot streak, you know, Mac O'Keefe at the end of the year, man, that guy couldn't miss. It was uh, – the guy just ran out of time, it seemed like. You know, they needed one more quarter, and you felt like they were going to come back on those guys. I mean, it's just the, the shooting display and how efficient they were with their shooting is something that I really admired. Um, yeah. You know, they really didn't have any wasted shots. It's, uh, you know, every, every shot they took really had a purpose. And I mean, any coach says that you want every shot to have a purpose, but at the end of the day, like, you know, you you felt nervous every time they were shooting that ball. Um, it just seemed that they were getting it to the right people at the right time and the right places. And, uh, you know, you want to talk about another team that just, you know, it's hard not to admire the flow of their offense, um, you know, and how, how quickly that ball moved and, 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 you know, how quickly they went through their reads. Um, you know, it's re really a pleasure to watch. It's entertaining for sure. Um, I, the, the first thing you commented on was the cutting aspect of it. I mean, they have the sort of the two man game and mirrors on wings and sort of the backside exchange occurring and that stuff, you know, we've, people have seen that and it's awesome. The hang up game they played also was sick. Like the way they would like put you um, in a position where you, you just couldn't leave a man in that backside pipe. But the, the, the way that sometimes they would end up instead of just having a backside exchange with a ball side sort of two man or mirror, the way they would start cutting their top center guy down, they got so many layups over the course of the season where they just literally were just like guys cutting wide open. And honestly, the, the element of cutting you up from middies, you almost never see in, 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 in this modern lacrosse game. And it's because of the balance that it requires. But um, what, what are your thoughts on that? No, it's just that it's, it honestly reminds me of, you know, it's got some basketball ball influence to it as well yeah. the way that they high load a lot of their cuts mm -hmm. uh, I thought was really impressive the way that they were able to peel off Mac O'Keefe behind a lot of those cuts you mm -hmm. know they'd have guys cut too hard to the goal um, a lot of times I mean obviously if they were open they hit them but a lot of times those were just to pin down and let you know Mac come over the top for that that mid-range you know so I thought they had really good high low balance mm -hmm. uh, with their cuts and you're right. I mean, it's just the, the way that they moved with a purpose. It's, you know, that, that it would have been fun to be a fly in the wall at their practices to see how yeah. they, you know, how they would drill that. Cause man, come game to come game day, every cut, it seemed like they were cutting, like it was, you know, in an overtime game and they were about to score the game winner. And, um, you know, and they're not feeding that ball every time they're cutting like that. And it's, so it's just it's really cool to see you know, a, a group like that buy into an offense like that. Cause a lot of that cutting is you're cutting without ego, right. And you're, yeah. you're cutting to get somebody else open, uh, not yourself. And so it's, it's pretty impressive. They did have a really nice array of parts also, you know, yeah. they just had a lot of different guys. <laughs> that helps too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, but some unique differences, you know, mm -hmm. um, let's talk a little bit about both those teams in the hangup game. I mean, you know, um, I just see you guys do a ton of it, uh, but it's gotta be one of those things in the back of your mind, like, man, I, I, I love the way they're able to create such simple offense and, and make it almost like a five on five in front of the cage when people are so worried about that hang up guy. I mean, how many times did Yale come around and score like a hands free moral come around and score off that, that little show hang up. But if you, you know, it's so, it's such a hard, it seems like it would be so easy to take it away, but what's your opinion on why it's so dangerous? Yeah, I, I think it just creates indecision, right? It's, uh, it's, it's an aspect of the game that is definitely touched upon. But, like, how many people out there are actually spending 
Uh, you're not nearly spending as much as much time as your hung defense and and that part of the game as you are your normal six on six. So unless it's something that you preach both offensively and defensively, it's something you got to carve out time and practice to, to do uh, if you know you're going up for it. So right away, it creates this level of indecision. If someone's only working on it for two, three days and prep, you know, they could have a great solid plan, plan but do they have the time and the, uh, the, the have they logged the minutes to, to rep it? Um, you know, and so, you know, you got to communicate. You got to be on the same page. What's your goalie doing? What's the defenseman doing? Is he behind the cage? Is he above the cage? Are you okay with being hung up? How much time's left on the shot clock? Yeah. You know, it, it adds all these layers to such a small portion of the game. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's definitely interesting. It's something that, uh, you know, it definitely, I think every, every offensive coach has probably thought about it, you yeah. know, and you see it more and more. So not only are people thinking about it, but they're starting to really commit to it. Um, you Denver know, but, really kind of, you know, was the team that did it the most over the course of the last maybe five right. years. Um, but the hang-up game is so interesting because, like, when people think of hang-ups, they think of, all right, my man is in front and I'm behind and he's stuck there, you know. And that, that's kind of like – that's one element of it. But the bigger element is what's going on while the ball's up on the wing and you're sitting there on the backside pipe seeing if your guy's helping or if your man is sort of on the ball side and you just sort of fade back and get those, like, layup come-arounds like Morrill got. Every game, Morrill would have, you know, he'd come around and have a hands-free shot around the other backside of the net. No question. I mean, that's where that indecision comes in, right? You know, am I really going to take these two steps this way? Or is that opening up a lane for, for the Dodger? You know, am I, you, know, you got to think about that too. You know, are you clogging space for the Dodger to take away that dive aspect of things, right? It's, you know, are you just that concerned with your man where you're just going to take him completely out of it? It's, uh, you know, it, it gives, I can see where it can give defensive coordinators headaches. It's uh, something that, you know, you have to spend time on because of how efficient both those teams are at doing it. Yeah. You know, but it was a, it was a magical run. And you guys, there was something, uh, something in the water. Um, but, you know, I actually think that, you know, there was a lot of elements to, to your guys' season, but, but they're none more important than the belief that the, that the players had. Um, and I actually I have a belief that Lars is very good at not only preparing teams, but just like a great goalie just has a knack for making saves and a great score, the ball goes in for him. I think Lars has a knack for winning games. And I think that the combination of like all of these factors are just amazing. But what was it like to have a team that like kind of could be comeback kids and not really, you know, not get phased and just keep playing? Well, it didn't get e any easier as the season went along. It was not, it's not like you do it a couple of times and the next one it's like business as usual. They're equally stressful. Uh, if anything, they continue to get more and more stressful. It's uh, – I mean, we had a fantastic senior group. Uh, we had a fantastic upper class in general uh, that just refused to lose. I mean, Ryan Conrad, I cannot say enough good things about that man and what he did for our program as a leader. Uh, and then obviously what he did on the field. Um, you know, you watch that, you go back and watch that Maryland game. You know, I don't think I've ever seen someone will his team to win as much as Ryan did in that game. Um, he was How about just, the ground ball against uh, Yale? Oh, yeah. I mean, the, the ground ball against Yale, the what ground ball against I've ever seen. Overtime, You know, he's just he's, – he's, every time we needed a big play, he was there. I mean, you go back to our our first comeback win, um, you know, Princeton, he's winning the overtime faceoff. Uh, you know, he's winning that ground ball. In the Syracuse game, he's picking up big ground balls when we're down by a couple. He's uh, – you know, he was everywhere. And, you know, I think, though um, – you know, as much as we talk about our senior class and, you know, our upperclassmen in general, you know, our second year guys, um, you know, I give them a lot of credit. You know, I, I always think that a great team is, uh, you know, as much as it's cliche for a coach to say you only go as far as your seniors and how important your senior class can be for a team. I really do think that, you know, the, the sophomore class, that second year class is, is just as important. Uh, this is a group that, you know, in the grand scheme of life, they got a lot of good things going for them. They still got two more years of, of college left. They, you know, they, the most important decision they're really making is picking out their, their major, right. You know, they're not even that concerned about their jobs yet. They might be kicking around a couple of internships, but you know, they, uh, there's just not that clock that the seniors and even the juniors have um, 
of, of the, that real world clock. So, you know, you, they, these are the guys that can keep practice light, that can bring the energy that uh, can really help drive your, your culture home. And, and, you know, we had a fantastic second year group uh, that really, you know, brought along our first years and, um, you know, between Ian Laviano, Matt Moore, John Fox, uh, you know, just to name a couple. I mean, th those guys were just as important um, and really helped, you know, drive the points home as much as the seniors kind of laid the groundwork. You, know, you need buy-in from everybody. And a lot of that comes with that, that second year group. If they're all in and on board, it makes it easier for the freshmen to be on board. And obviously the, the those juniors, those third years um, will be right there with those seniors. So, um, you know, that's what, that's where it started from was just, you know, off the field, how close these guys were and how hard they worked. And, you know, you win one and momentum's a, a funny thing. It's, yeah. uh, it's pretty contagious and uh, yeah. don't get me wrong. We had our lucky, we had our lucky bounces for sure. Yeah. Uh, we were, we were very fortunate there. And, but I think we did a great job too of talking about that, you know, and, and, and understanding how fortunate we were each time to come away with a victory and, and and I think it really made us appreciate the season that we had. Um, yeah. it, uh, you know, after every game, we, I'm sure you heard on the broadcast, we did a lot of our – we practiced on every Sunday in season and did a lift and kind of put the game away that we just played on Saturday on Sunday so that come Tuesday after our day off Monday, we could prepare for the next opponent. And so those Sundays, we sat there a ton and just – you know, especially as an offense, understanding, hey, like, you know, we caught a break there. You know, and we, we happen to talk about that a lot and, and you know, kind of continuing to build towards that that perfect game. You'll never have a completely perfect game, but we wanted to build towards that and understand that, you know, we still hadn't played our best lacrosse game. Um, and that kind of built up. And, you know, you find that, you know, you see that Yale game at the end, that was the culmination of, of, a, of all of it. I mean, that was as great of a lacrosse game we could have played. You know, yeah, well, you guys definitely did. Yeah, offense, yeah, defense. It's just the most complete game that we played since we've been at Virginia, honestly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the defense was incredibly impressive, and all year long, <laughs> unbelievable on the ride. And you know, it's it's really interesting because you know I feel like Lars has always schematically been a great riding coach and loves his ten man rides and. Bump, put, bumping up the stacks and you know he's been doing it for a long time and you guys did it at Brown it was great um, but it was also this combination of schematically well coached but but just the tenacity of your attack you know to me made it I mean you can always scheme a ride but but you can't scheme the kind of a uh, hustle and athleticism and intensity that you had out of your attack yeah and you know that you nailed it it's adding when we move Matt Moore to attack we didn't realize how much it was going to affect our ride. We knew it was going to help our offense. We didn't realize how much it was going to help our riding game. It just added a whole nother level of athlete, um, you know, to that unit that had already been a great riding unit. And now yeah. you add that little extra athleticism and it, it can be suffocating. And, you know, it was great. It's, it was such a fun part of the year because, you know, riding and clearing, you know, in your game planning, um, you know, it's not the most exciting parts of the game plan, right? Mm -hmm. Everyone wants to know how you're going to defend, how you're going to attack, you know, those kinds of things. But so this year, you know, with how much success we had, it really made it fun. Guys really enjoyed the prep that went into understanding how teams clear and, and where we ride and, and, and how we were going to approach it. So it, it, it uh, added just this little extra bonus. And then obviously with the hooting and hollering from the bench and all that yelling as the clock ran down, just added to it and really was our identity. Um, yeah. I mean, I mean, Maryland game, you guys were struggling early, but the ride really, you know, kept you guys right where you needed to be to be able to win that game. Absolutely. And, you know, and you, you look at the, the, the Duke game, you know, it's, we're down, we're down two with a minute and a half left and Duke has the ball, you know, and, you know, it's, we didn't really necessarily have that much pressure on the ball, but I just think the, the, the idea of our ride created mm -hmm. that turnover, you know, just knowing that they couldn't take their time and now yeah. some, someone's rushing a little bit. And so it's uh, it was as much as it was effective as its own being the ride when we would actually employ it, just the thought of it, we felt like really impacted teams and we knew that it was making them uncomfortable because now the coaches had to spend a lot of time during the week, prepping on how to clear like this that was not a that was not a gimme 
uh, when you were playing us this past year. Yeah. Um, let's turn the um, conversation for a minute to player development. Um, I know it's something that you're very passionate about. I, I really enjoyed watching you guys at practice, even though it, it was like unseasonably cold that day um, in Charlottesville back in January. But to watch the, the, the stuff that you're working on um, coming in, could you just talk about the progression of player development, the emphasis on player development, all the small sided games, um, you know, from, from when you first got there um, in the fall of 2016, right through to now kind of like what the evolution has been like and, and what, what you take pride in and maybe some of the specifics of what you're working on. Yeah, it's, um, you know, it's something that, you know, from day one working with Lars was brought to my attention how important it was. And, uh, Something that I've always liked. I've always liked teaching. I always like getting my hands on guys and, and and helping them reach that next level. But then it it was kind of like that on steroids. Once I started working with uh, with Lars at Brown and then on to Virginia, I think the biggest difference between when we first got to Virginia to now is that you know when we got to Virginia, you know, we had three phases that we wanted to introduce. Uh, the first and foremost was our transition phase and getting that ball up and out. So there was some, some player development that needed to be taught on just how to play transition, how to come off of picks and transition on a pass down, pick down, where your landmarks are, what your footwork should look like, you know, um, things like that, that now are kind of innate and ingrained in our upperclassmen and they in turn teach our younger guys. Um, so it's gotten a so that, that was started pretty basic and it's only grown from there. We've gotten a little bit more intricate with what we've been teaching. Um, you know, I've changed, not necessarily changed, we just put a bigger emphasis on like you and I were talking about earlier, just footwork. Um, how important our feet are as ball carriers and as Dodgers uh, and how the lack of, of good and, uh, quick footwork and proper footwork can get you in trouble um, more than, you know, other poor mechanics. I really do think that everything starts and ends with, with your feet. And so we, when it comes to dodging, we do a lot of, we put a lot of focus on, on that aspect of it, you know, cone out some, some things. Um, what are some examples? Um, you know, so with the, uh, with attackmen, one, one of my favorite things to, to teach you know, and I, I can use Matt Moore as a great example because he, he he was a midfielder up until November of this past year when we moved him to attack. So he's learning a completely new position this year. And, you know, teaching him um, how to use his feet to slow himself down, um, I think that one of those things, and that's something that we, we worked on with Dylan as well at Brown um, when we are talking about, um, you know, slowing him down, was just understanding how you don't have to go in a straight line every time. You know, I think Matt was so used to, as a midi, you know, the classic alley dodge or a sweep, and there was just no bounce to his step. There was, you know, there was no depth to his dodging is a term that we use. Uh, so, you know, repping that out where, you know, you have cones where you drive up uh, to that GLE area and instead of continuing to, to turn that corner and drive straight up to that, that five and three, five and five area where you can get yourself into a lot of trouble is teaching that footwork of, of hitting that GLE and your first step being actually out to the sideline and widening yourself out and, and understanding when that's appropriate. And, um, you know, and, and the way we describe it here is, you know, that's appropriate when you know you don't have a clear cut step, right? If you've beaten your man clean, you can just turn the corner and finish. Most defenses aren't going to be that ready to go. Uh, whereas if you're kind of grinding it out and that guy's on your hip and let's just say you have a half a step, let's just take a, that, quick sidestep out to to the sideline not only does it slow you down but it can free your hands it can allow it can free your eyes up and allow you to to read and react to what the defense is is showing you uh, and then you can always continue back up there once you take those couple steps back up that field and get to that island area that that yeah. five and five six and six type area you can always get back there so Right. Um, that's that's just one example of something that we like to work on. Like I said, we worked on with Matt a lot. Yeah. Um, well, let just, me look at a game winner against Duke. Yep. Yeah, it's a perfect example. He bounced yeah. out and came back underneath because he had the angle. He took his man out wider. They're hedging. He throws it inside. Game over. 
you know, and that, that game in particular is a fun one to go back and watch because you watch that second half. Um, just watch the second half. You don't even watch the first half. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, uh, no, you watch that second half, and, and, you know, all those goals that we scored, we drilled to some extent that week. Uh, you know, we, we drill our, our dive freeze look at nauseum, right? That, that dive cut to the back pipe that, that I think you call oh. it a stay or a, a sit. Uh, you know, we call it a freeze. Uh, so that's something we drill every, every week. Um, the freeze is the gun. And then the, the dive cut and the freeze, is that what you call yeah, it? Yeah, we call it a freeze. Yep. Yep. And, um, you know, so that's something that's in our repertoire every week of drills that we do. Uh, but, you know, you have a step down straight up the hash that we felt like could be open. So that's something we have that, that Ryan Conrad drifting across the top look that we drill all the time within that offense. Yeah. Uh, but then the game winner, the more important one, uh, obviously the most important goal with the, that last one that won it, that role to feed that Matt had was something that we, we felt like we could uh, take advantage of um, not just against that opponent. It was a, we've had a couple opponents where we felt like it, but it was just cool to see something that we drilled that, that week. Yeah. Uh, that'd be the game winner. And like I said, all those goals in that second half were, were straight from drills. Um, so that was, as a coach, you, you, you love seeing that obviously, because yeah. you know, it's a, it just drives home that point a little bit more. There's just this no man's land that you get out to when you bounce a little bit that you're dangerous enough to score. So they have to kind of show. And, you know, again, against Yale, you guys just scored it. And against Duke, you were able to feed it. And they just right. different ways. And you guys were able to do that. That, that, that angle, though, uh, to feed, you know, rolling back. And by the way, Matt Moore was a midi, but he was a rollback midi. I mean, like. Oh, yeah. Oh, no, don't, don't get me wrong. Yeah. More so than most, I thought. Yeah. 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 Uh, oh, no question. But uh, even his roles were pretty flat lined. You know what I mean? Like there was no depth to, to anything really. So that's where, that's the, the aspect that we added, but no, you're right. It's uh, that was the beauty of the offense, right? It was just, it was kind of that pick your poison. It's uh, you know, it's, I, I have Herman Boone from remember the Titans in the back of my head, you know, it's just like Nova King, give it time. It always works. You know what I mean? It's just like, uh, that's, uh, that's how we felt. Uh, and then it was cool to see our guys believe in that. Right. And they knew that, you know, that if it didn't work, that it wasn't because a def, you know a couple times defense obviously plays great, but most of the time it was because of a lack of attention to detail at some point along the way with us and and why it, why it didn't work in that position. So uh, that was that was the fun part of it for sure. Yeah. Um, let's talk a little bit about recruiting. Um, I know you have some sort of interesting thoughts. I don't know if you're willing to share them, but as far as like um, recruiting, like you know like where players kind of come from and kind of what you're looking at in players. I mean, it's easy to talk about, it's easy to see certain athletes. You can see them three fields away, but there's the, it's the, it's the intangibles in the IQ. I mean, Lars talks about how he'll have a kid come in and make him get on the whiteboard. So you can sort of see where his thought process is, but, you know, generally speaking, you know, what, what are you kind of looking for in athletes? And, you know, there's going to be some parents and some kids that are listening to this podcast and, they, you know, they want to know um, maybe some of your philosophies on what you like, what you look for, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, no, it's, uh, you know, I, first and foremost, recruiting, just like a lot of things, I'm pretty analytically driven. Uh, I love numbers. Uh, just uh, it's numbers to me are facts. It's uh, something that, you know, the more information I have, the, the more uh, efficiently I feel like I can do my job. So, uh, I try to use analytics any chance I get and, you know, recruiting is one of those, you know, so you know, we've been able to track where college all Americans are from and, you know, what areas produce more and just to not necessarily that's the reason that we're only going to take people from those areas, but it's just kind of can in an otherwise crazy world kind of just consolidate our focus and, and make it a little bit more concise and efficient. Uh, Cause that's all recruiting is, right. You just want to be as efficient as possible, right. You want to make sure you're, you're finding the right guys that come in and produce and become college all Americans. So we're, that's, that's the goal. And so, you know, that's, that's where it starts. It starts with numbers, starts with data, and then it comes with, with our eyes and uh, in our ears, you know, talking to high school and, and club coaches is a great way to get some insight on how, uh, how a kid is off the field, how, how tough he is, uh, how much he enjoys the work and the grind. And, um, you know, does he have that, that refuse to lose compete factor 
uh, that obviously we, we had a roster riddled of this, this year. Uh, so it's only put a bigger focus on it. Uh, one of my favorite things these days, honestly, that I look for in recruiting is uh, what I, I can't take credit for what I'm going to uh, coin it as. I have to give credit to actually Dom Starge is the one that first said this to me, uh, but was sh uh, it's shooting without ego. So it's uh, something that I look for now, especially in attackmen. Um, you know, are they shooting for corners or are they shooting to score, score the ball? You know, and it's, uh, it's an interesting concept and something that, you know, the more you look, f the more you think about it the, and the more you look for it, the more you see it. Uh, there are some guys out there that look great and, you know, great off the dodge, great separation, super athletic. And, you know, they're looking pin seeking for that, that corner the whole time. And at the end of the day, you know, they're hitting the cage maybe once uh, where you got these guys that just, you know, find ways to put the ball in the net and are mm -hmm. shooting these ugly bounce shots that just so for whatever reason seem to go in, you know, and it's, uh, you know, they might not be the prettiest, but man, they are, they are efficient. And, uh, you know, like I said, I just, when, when Dom told me that, you know, that concept of shooting without ego, I immediately wrote it down. It just was uh, such a cool term. Right. Because, again, like, no, no one really wants to shoot bounce shots. Right. You don't you know, it's uh, it's one of those things where you go out to the yard. Um, most people out there, when they go out and shoot on their own, they're they're aiming for top right, top left. Right? I mean, how many times do you hear kids around a goal saying, oh, I'm going to hit top right this time? You know, it's uh, you know, it's when you get out there and you see somebody that's that's shooting those those shots that, you know, doesn't matter what they look like, man. They're going in the net. Uh, there's, there's something to be said for that. So it's something that I've enjoyed looking for this summer. Um, you know, and it's pleasantly surprised to see a, a bunch of guys out there that do that. Um, and so it's not just all these woo shooters uh, looking for the highlight reel type shots. It's obviously great to have guys like a Michael Krause or Matt Moore that can literally run by their guy. But then there's other players that are better at sort of getting by their guy. And they can be equally difficult to guard because they can use fakes and, and physicality and hesitations to be able to manipulate. Um, how do you view those two types of players? Do you like to have both in, in, in your, in your offensive set or do you have a preference? Uh, I don't have a preference. Um, honestly, as long as I feel like this, the, it doesn't matter on either side of it. It's just, is this lacrosse player understanding what he's seeing, right? Or is he just running by people or is he just kind of just leaning in mm -hmm. or is he actually, does he actually process, all right, there's no slide coming or, or this slide's coming this way, or this guy took too many steps this one way, uh, you know, so trying to dissect the IQ of a recruit is definitely one of the more challenging things to yeah. do, uh, yeah. especially in there's fantastic teachers out there. You know, you can go and get great lessons and go to great camps and clinics and, and be taught all these skills. And the, the level of skill on the recruiting trail has gone through the roof. You know, yeah. there's a lot of people that can do a lot of different things. So it's trying to dissect who actually understands what they're doing and when to properly use it. Or is this guy just going because he's drilled it 100 times, which is great. You know, it's great. Great skill set to have. But is it just built on? just reps or is it built on understanding within the reps and so and sometimes you, you you take a guy that's put all the reps in hoping that you know there's understanding behind it and sometimes there's like wow this guy really understands it but he just hasn't had the, the time and place to to practice some things and so you kind of gravitate toward th those guys that are a little bit more malleable uh in in their development uh, but you know it's kind of so to answer your question is really there's i don't have i can yeah. i love playing, you know, working with both those types of players. It's just, yeah. you know, hopefully they have that certain level of IQ where, you know, they understand what they're doing so we can give them more freedom on the field. So that, that at the end of the day is what we're trying to do. Yeah. It's, um, it is really difficult to evaluate IQ. And it's also, cause sometimes you'll see something, like you said, that was really deceptive or really smart. I mean, for example, um, I have a theory that virtually every shot that goes in is generally was a deceptive shot, whether you meant to or not, right. or it was a perfect shot. Right. Right. I mean, if it's perfect, it's perfect. If you shoot it hard enough and place it perfectly, yeah. you know, it goes in, it doesn't have to be deceptive, but there's a lot of shots, you know, but when goalies catch them, it was generally not deceptive. It could have been that you missed your spot. 
But a lot of times there's shots that like go in because they missed their spot. <laughs> and that's because if they had thrown it where they meant to throw it, the goalie would have caught it. You know, they would have gone low, but it, it actually slid out high and it yeah. turned into a, you know, and, um, and I think it's true with a lot of things, um, whether it be moves, you know, there's certain moves that people do really well, but then they become a one trick pony because like you said, they don't actually understand it. They just did this one thing that happened to work. And once people sort of pick up on it, they won't be able to make almost like the next, the next read and right. uh, the next, you know, which is like kind of like when you're playing basketball with your brother or whatever. And it's like, you know, you have one move and he starts guarding that and then you get your next move and then you get your next move. And right. you know, so much of the IQ I think actually comes from just playing in that rather than instruction, which, which I think is a more shallow level. No question. And, and the, the problem, and, you know, I think one of the problems with that model of, you know, as great as the instruction is, is that there's no failure in instruction as much as there is in pickup. Uh, you're talking about playing, you know, I grew up, you know, like I said, I'm one of four boys in my family. I have three brothers. I'm the third of, of four. You know, you learn by competing and not only competing, but by losing. Like it's, it's, if you have a move that works on your older brother and all of a sudden he starts defending it, you're not going to, you're either going to quit because you yeah. don't have a fire in that drive or you're going to figure it out, right? You're going to, you failed. So you're going to figure out another way to beat him. Yeah. Um, and so that's where that's a little bit lost in just the pure instruction model Yeah, is that competitive aspect that, you know, brings a little bit of failure, a little bit of, of, adversity to to the individual um and then that that puts you in that fight or flight moment where all right am i going to adjust and make some changes on my own or, or at least seek out the instruction at that point to understand how to change or you know or am i just going to be a, a okay with not you know not being successful and so that's uh that's a big part you i mean you nailed it the uh, the lack of pickup um is a little concerning it, it, it's, it's but you know it's uh something that we try to do a lot, you know, we can go. Yeah, I want you guys. I mean, you guys, oh, yeah. Yeah. we can, can only control Virginia lacrosse and, yeah. you know, we just had a week at camp and you better believe we did a ton of small ball and, you know, a ton of those short fit sided games and, uh, you know, any chance we can get, we, we love that, that pickup style. It's, uh, it, it's helped us out a ton and we'll continue to be a, a big proponent of what we try to do. I spent almost every day of this summer playing pickup. <laughs> playing three by with my daughters and and other kids that were around we were in Canada so we had like you know sometimes we'd have like junior a kids out playing with us you know you get some ex-pros you get you know 12 year olds it doesn't really matter because when you play enough the thing right. is, is that it teaches you the game without without, without instruction and I, I think listen you and I are both coaches I, I love to teach oh, but yeah. I, I but I think that it's so much more effective if you've played a ton of pickup and you kind of know how to play, now you can teach somebody something that they can actually implement and read and understand immediately. So. Yeah, and, and just even, you know, we're in, you know, we're fortunate enough that when we do a lot of these pickup things, we're around our guys. And so just seeing it in live action and yeah. then teaching on the fly within the pickup games and then yeah. seeing them apply it right away is huge too. Because um, you see that, that immediate return on – on the on the teaching portion you know and so but uh, it, it's, it's it's an interesting um because again they, like like you said i mean instructions are incredibly important player development is incredibly important but you can't have one without the other right you can't just go and play pickup all the time either you know <laughs> it's you just can't roll the ball out and play either so yeah it's, no it's it's it is it is the it, you know for for parents that are listening or coaches that are listening i mean there is no better bang for your buck than getting a three by three net tennis balls and letting kids play because they will figure it out um not to say that the instruction isn't important because we already know it is but we've kind of taken it away uh with with all of the high level coaching that we do there's almost no pure decision making on the kids parts which is really back to the beginning of tufts university where you really the decision making was on the program and it's one of the reasons why you won championships and I believe that you've kind of let that you know with Lars you guys have kind of uh, um, continued to inspire that throughout your coaching no and 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 when we were do when we would do captain's practices at at Tufts I mean the two most common drills that we would do would be your classic West Jenny three on two continuous which is yeah. essentially 
small, you know, it's been essentially three ball, three by with big goals. Yeah. And then, and then we played pickup, we'd, we'd scrimmage, you know, and, you know, we do some short side field stuff as well, but a lot of times we just roll the ball out and play and, and, and coach ourselves playing a game with, without the coaches there and just kind of mm-hmm. figuring it out. Right. And, and each game was different. Each day was different. And you kind of had to learn and adjust and see what works and what didn't. So it's a, uh, no, you're right. It's uh, that's kind of where it all started with me, and uh, thankfully, I have a fantastic boss that yeah. believes in the same things that I do. And uh, so we, we, from the get go, we're able to see eye to eye with that at, at at Brown, and have taken it with us here. So great, man. Well, we got to catch up um, offline at some point. Um, I learned a lot of really cool stuff. I want to share with you this summer, so I'll check in. Awesome. <laughs> couple weeks but um Sean thank you so much for taking the time to come on love talking to you love talking lacrosse with you um have an awesome end of the summer thank you thanks for having me on I'll talk soon hello TSA what's up all right we'll do all right thanks bye the philacrosophy podcast is brought to you in part by the JM3 lacrosse academy this 10-week online program is designed to teach cutting-edge lacrosse skills and IQ Athletes will learn dozens of new techniques, creative drills, X's and O's, and most importantly, how to integrate it all into their game. To learn more or start getting better today, go to www.jm3sports.com forward slash academy.